Surveillance. My name is Tumor. I'm a research fellow at the Open Technology Institute, which is part of the New America Foundation based in Washington, D.C. Um, for anybody who still feels very much in the food coma, that's what this green map is for, so take advantage of it. Um, we're here today um, because, as you are well aware, since the Arab Spring, we've become a lot more aware of technology that's being exported by Western companies to countries such as Libya, Syria, and Bahrain um, to end users that have used this technology for human rights abuses. Um, and it's dual use technology that has been used for surveillance and monitoring. So this is a new problem that uh, we all face and that we are trying to grapple with. And the buzzwords in terms of companies are obviously Blue Code, Ghana, Finn Fisher, and the Citizen Lab has done some excellent research in terms of hacking team and trying to parse out what technology are we talking about, what countries are we talking about. And um, we at OTI have been looking at the policy uh, menu that's um, available to address this, specifically export control being one of the policy options that might want to pursue. And we are doing that through a joint project with Privacy International and Digital Gesellschaft with Ben Wagner, who's here uh, being part of that as well. Um, and just to get everybody on the same page and make sure that we're not talking about different things, uh, what are export controls? They are not sanctions. Uh, currently, the US has five sanctions regimes in place that are comprehensive sanctions uh, against Syria, Iran, um, North Korea, Sudan, and Cuba. Um, so those are separate from the export controls that we will be discussing today. Um, the export controls that we will be discussing are the worldwide regime covering all countries that are not a ban per se, but that is a lateral regime in terms of reviewing exports to specific countries with licensing policies in place for specific technologies that might require the exporter to apply for a license or at least notify the government that this technology is being exported to that country. Um, final point of this introductory remarks is in December 2013, the Bosna arrangement, which is a multilateral export control regime focused on, among others, dual use technology, and currently consists of 41 member states, announced new export controls relating to intrusion software and IP network surveillance systems. And uh, we handed out the actual language, uh, which is the handout that you have on your, on your chairs, uh, in case the discussion gets into the weeds of that, that we uh, that you actually have it in your hand uh, if, if you want to. Um, the controls were agreed on by those member states. They now need to be implemented in each of those 41 countries. Um, you have some countries that aren't formally part of the Bosnia regime, but that usually take it as a reference, Israel, China, to a certain extent. And um, this process is now underway in the US, with the US government looking into how to actually integrate these new controls within the US export control regime, which is something that we are looking into, as well as uh, something that the three gentlemen to my right um, have been thinking about. And with that, I'm going to introduce Danny Ryan, who's the international director at EFF, that I believe uh, everybody knows, so it doesn't um, uh, need further introduction. <laughs> Call <him. laughs> Unless you want me to tell about his time at the Committee to Protect Journalists um, for three years before he rejoined EFF, where he was working a lot on outreach. He's been spending 15 years on privacy um, and has a wealth of experience um, that uh, he will bring to the table today at being the moderator. Um, between Colin Anderson, who's an independent researcher, and as we've already heard, is doing a lot of research on Iran, and so it's some really interesting um, empirical research that I encourage everybody to uh, look at. Um, and then we have Fukami, who is from <coughs> Germany and a member of the Chaos Computer Club. Um, he's an IT um, security advisor to a company called um, Section 1, Section 1. Um, and he's here um, to argue uh, with a healthy skepticism and against export controls. And Colin, uh, in this discussion round, will uh, present views on why uh, this might be a viable uh, policy option. And with that, I'll hand it over to Danny. Uh, so, uh, I really like, so a friend of mine who was not a geek um, uh, once described geek conversations as being fact tennis. Which basically, rather than talking about the weather or anything, one person would go, I have a fact. And then the second person would go, I too have a fact that is connected to your fact. And they would just communicate and tie into facts. And the point where somebody lost 
was the point where somebody said, I no longer have any more facts. And that was like the dropped ball, and that was fact tennis, and it was 15 love. So I would actually like to see if we can keep <coughs> an incredibly extended volley of fact okay. tennis going here. In that I think that this is a discussion that is only just beginning, and I think that for a very long time it was highly theoretical. Um, we, many people had very um, uh, theoretical concerns about the dangers of technology being used for surveillance and intrusion, and other people had very theoretical principled objections about what a world would be like if we were obliged to regulate or control software. And then it became very practical all of a sudden. We knew that intrusion and surveillance was going on, and uh, as Tim said, um, we're now in a situation where um, people running export controls are actually attempting to solve this problem and uh, produce language. So uh, part of the, the history of this, and I think this is why I'm here, um, is, uh, so who here uh, knows pretty well the, the crypto wars as a, as a term? Okay, so is it, okay, so it's worth still spelling, because I think without an uh, understanding of, of the history of the crypto wars, it's hard to understand why this would even be a controversial issue to discuss. It seems like the, the, you know, uh, most of the language and rhetoric that you would see in public consumption about the idea that we have intrusion and surveillance software that is being sold to bad actors by companies who, as far as in many cases, we're aware that they know, they know that this is being used for human rights abuses um, by known human rights abusers. Why would you not place export controls to limit or regulate this kind of um, uh, this kind of trade? And I think one of the reasons why many people in the technical community are concerned about this is because of two things. One, uh, in many, many, many years ago in the nineties, um, this was a very fierce battleground over um, uh, attempts by, in particular, the U.S. government to control, for intents and, all intents and purposes, general purpose computation, um, the export of encryption, which as we all now know, and everybody who was involved in this debate on one side knew at the time, is an incredible, powerful tool for use by individuals to fight off surveillance and protect privacy. Um, the particular and peculiar conditions of that time meant that the, there was a very concerted attempt by the US government to regulate not just technology, but algorithms, software, equations, effectively, um, to the point where people were tattooing um, the, um, uh, the equations that put the underlying public key cryptography um, as a statement to point out that like, I am walking through customs and you uh, viewing my tattoo as, as a, an ammunition as an arm. So that battle was, and we've had debates here before, was, uh, was won. And it was won um, by making the argument that um, uh, code is speech, that this is actually a free speech issue, that you cannot legislate to control uh, uh, the communication of an idea, the communication, even if it's expressed in software, um, because that's a limitation on freedom of expression as well as being very impractical. So, having described that thing that happened many, many years ago um, and just set the context for this debate, I also want to emphasize that this is, in many ways, a very, very different discussion. Um, the encryption debate still continues. There are still export controls on encryption. Um, there has been a parallel discussion that's gone on about um, the regulation of the uh, market for exploit, exploits or zero days, which do have many characteristics in, uh, similar to this in that they are their code and, and have some of the issues. Um, but this is a different display, di debate. We're talking about uh, specifically um, the regulation of intrusion software and we're talking about the regulation of surveillance software and hardware. Um, but I totally understand if that seems a very nice debate, a difference, and I think we're going to explore what those differences are um, in this conversation. So that's the, the, the background context. Um, 
Uh, I think we can, I would like to make sure that anyone can chip in in this. We're in a round table, and I think there is as much expertise out in the, in the people not on white chairs than there is on the people on white chairs. <laughs> Simply in Tim's little finger, practically. Um, but I would like to sort of direct the questions, and then we can open it up. So, Colin, because of your background in, as a prominent researcher, um, as a regular uranium researcher, um, what is the problem that you think these export controls are seeking to solve? Both the problems that you either see and maybe also the problems that the governments that propose this language see. Well, so I think that, uh, and that was an excellent introduction that touched on a lot of the issues. Uh, what you've seen over the past decade is both a theoretical and a real conversation about the relationship between governments and the control of technologies and the provision of, of services to co potentially repressive governments. This is no more uh, sort of tangible than in the case of the Global Online Freedom Act that had the, whose general theme was to start to mitigate these stories about companies like Yahoo collaborating with uh, the Chinese state in order to reveal the identity of pseudonymous or anonymous activists. So we had that fundamental tension, and that was at the core, especially a decade ago, the tension that was making the news, which is that we have potential moral and, but no legal liabilities when it comes to uh, collaborating with regimes with substantial human rights abuses and a complete absence of rule of law. Uh, what we saw was, I think, a shift in priorities, in part because civil society, this is as much about civil society's ability to <coughs> accountability as it is governments. In the case of, of companies such as Google and Yahoo, we were able, uh, civil society organizations such as yours primarily, was able to inflict so much damage to the legitimacy of these companies that they were forced to, at least on the face, begin to have conversations about what is the role of human rights in their operations. That's why you have organizations such as the Global Network Initiative. And this is why you have things like audits. These are potentially and often flawed processes, but there are processes that were put into place based off of civil society's ability uh, to, to force a conversation on these companies. What you've seen <coughs> primarily, or, or, or uh, largely in the case of the, the companies that provide surveillance technologies, is that there is very little sort of touchstone to enforce that sort of accountability. So if you look like a com at a company like Hacking Team or Gamma, how do you have a consumer-facing boycott? In fact, if you, if you look at this, for example, um, these companies act with behaviors that have no other characteristic than, than malfeasance. And I think that we agree on this primarily. There's, this is not a, a, a conversation about the duplicity of the, com uh, of the companies. We agree on that. This is a conversation about the mechanisms of enforcement and potentially even legal uh, punitive uh, mechanisms. So uh, the encryption debate comes into this conversation because of old scars and because of also steps by the, the UK uh, export control organization that uh, these were steps that were made in good faith, but were clumsy. And so in the case of Gamma, you saw that they attempted to control uh, Finn Fisher based off, of, based off of encryption restrictions. Encryption is still control. Let's not forget that. En encryption is still control. In the US, not that much like, like other countries. Yeah, so, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, exercise, I think, the, the privilege of talking from a, a US standpoint. Um, because in fact, uh, on Fine this case, privilege, the, uh, the greatest privilege of all. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I say privilege because I, I think that there's going to be a lot of instances where we talk about where there is a, a, a fundamental and meaningful difference in, in implementation, or, or rather in cases of implementation. And we can take a lot of US examples that I think are more developed than the European examples. And so I want to, I, I definitely it's important to introduce that, that nationality into that, because I think we, we agree that uh, the EU's restrictions are, are made, or um, openings, exemptions, are not as open as the United States. And, and that absolutely is, is a point of, of <laughs> opportunity for civil society and, and to, to push on 
greater relaxation of encryption both in the United States and in Europe. We have no, no doubt about that. But this was the UK using encryption restrictions. Yes, to yeah, and, and, and in all cases, there is still restrictions on the provision of, of uh, encryption specifically to governments. And so that was exercised. So we have to say malfeasance based off of the reaction of these companies. What was the reaction of Gamma to that control? For one, they started to move their legal liabilities out of, out of companies or countries where they would uh, uh, potentially be controlled. But they removed encryption. And so when they were, when the UK government attempted to control based on encryption, they just said, fine, we're going to put an unencrypted product out there. That's malfeasance. And that's malfeasance that we, can't, we have no interaction with. Uh, and, and I, I want to I make one point, and then I'll sort of hand it back, is that you know, what we've had since then, because we have no ability to, to sort of reach into this legally, morally, as consumers, we've fought, or we, we've struggled. And so we've had, for example, uh, lawsuits like the EFF. The problem is, is that the, the legal standing for, for uh, taking up claims against foreign countries and foreign activities in the United States has only been diminished by recent cases having to do with the alien tort statute. And so if you look at the EFF case, the EFF case with regard to Ethiopia and hacking team is, is such a small, a small subset. That doesn't fix the problem. That just says, as long as you have standing, as long as you have somebody to sue, sue within the United States, and as long as the victim of, the, of, these, uh, of these human rights violations is in the United States, uh, this, is, this is the only thing you can control for legally. And so we have fundamentally no mechanisms in which to coerce legally or economically companies into behaviors that, that respect fundamental human rights. And so this is, the, this is the issue that we're struggling with. So I'm still going to wear my moderator sure. hat here, so I want to go, no, actually, and throw in the what? We have right. very few. We attempt to assert know your customer policies, but what does hacking team care about knowing its customer? But so let's let's try and fill in fill in the sure. gaps here. So people understand the background of the gamma case. We've got a general okay, great. Um, so I guess right, we'll talk a little bit more about how what tools we have to control this better. Sure. But I want to introduce Gami and. Um, um, let you explain a little bit about the concerns that I think many in the technical community have about this specific way of controlling um, uh, uh, these, these kinds of uses. Okay, um, first of all, um, uh, and just another like, detail about myself, I'm, I'm doing like practical security, which means like uh, I'm attacking for money, um, like governments, banks, uh, Whatever. So uh, I see a lot of like real life security or insecurity. So um, yeah, and it is itself like a challenging uh, but very interesting job. Um, and what what we rely uh, on is stuff which is uh, regulated inside this um, part about intrusion software because what we do is we intrude. Um, and my concern is basically. There are basically two things. One thing is um, the whole discussion was about like uh, controlling software um, and like technology for surveillance. But what we actually end up with is like an exploit regulations uh, and not uh, real like control on surveillance technology. Because um, for one, if you look at the, the definitions, uh, it's a very very good definition of what an exploit actually is. Although the people from PI uh, and other people told me, uh, we take care that we don't have export regulations inside Basana. Why is the problem? The problem is Basana is basically a weapon controls regulation, which means it controls uh, piece of weapons, proliferation, and other means of like dangerous technology. Um, exploits are something which we need to understand computation. Without exports, we, can, we don't understand what the, the side effects of, of computation are. Um, and without exports, we are not able to do our job. Um, the other thing is, there's another part, 
about the IP network surveillance systems. This is even more interesting because uh, on one hand, this exact technology is mandatory for every telco doing business in all of the Desmarais countries. So the interesting thing is that we try to regulate export and declare something, a dangerous technology, which is mandatory for all of our communication. And this, like, this shows my point very, very clearly that this whole policy is completely awkward in terms of um, it shows that you know, like, there was this nice expression from this, uh, uh, from this gentleman saying, if you have something inside controls which you use yourself, you should think. And that's exactly what we see with the um, export regulations on, um, on this technology. And so the fun part is that um, the whole definition of the IP surveillance system stuff says, okay, it doesn't uh, apply to marketing software which, you know, like as a technologist and as someone who really closely wrote, uh, 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 read all the papers of, of Snowden and so, uh, it shows that they actually use those software for surveillance and for, for targeting people. So this is, you know, like there, there are several things inside this, uh, this regulations which are simply either stupid or even dangerous. And the dangerous part is, um, I forgot to mention that, the chilling effect you have on people producing exports. Um, we, for example, refuse to release um, exports anymore because it's much too dangerous to, to, um, to get somehow involved in some cases where some you know, like stupid guy from somewhere uses these exploits in um, certain ways. And also, we refuse to work with uh, in, in countries outside, outside Basana because what we offer is exploitation services for tables, for example, to work for our not services. We use exploits to show vulnerabilities inside their, their, um, uh, their infrastructure, but you know, we don't know what is going to happen there. So we, uh, we are on the way to like, don't uh, work with those countries anymore just for don't get into trouble. We don't have the people to, to, to help us uh, uh, in those cases. And uh, we don't, you know, like, we are not lawyers, we are hackers, so. So, the, I, I want to just ask a quick, quick question, which is, do you think, is this an objection that you have to this particular language, or do you think that it's actually impossible to write an export control that wouldn't have these chilling effects <coughs> or, um, or, or this sort of general prohibition on useful tools? Um, so, I... In general, I'm not against like weapon controls and uh, like proliferation uh, things, um, but uh, I'm strictly against um, ways of controlling general technology and exp and like um, regulating um, like execution of code right. is something which is not going to be uh, in a well place if we talk about weapon controls. Yeah. And I mean, like, I have another nice example why, especially Vasana, is a big problem. Um, I know a couple of people who, uh, who um, offer technology for encryption, especially like hardened phones. During the last couple of weeks, they, they try to export the stuff to Ukraine. And uh, since it takes a while to get uh, the, 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 the proper papers for that, the people in Ukraine didn't, simply didn't get those phones. So if anybody is telling me that this is helping someone, I don't know, I don't think so. Especially if it comes to those like corner cases where it's not about weapons, uh, but about other means. And if you really look closely to the Vasana arrangements, there are lots and lots of those weird things in, inside it. For example, for uh, specific computation things where they say uh, you're allowed to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to export stuff uh, with like certain ability, like, uh, if it can do more than... So your critique is that this is always going to be too broad, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, so fine, you get to reply to this because... You... But, but what I mean <coughs> is, is, since the release, there's been a consistent mischaracterization of both the controls and the process. Vassanar is not just a, a, a munitions list. In fact, it's a dual-use items list in its name. 
And so in its name, as an arrangement, it concedes this exact point, that there is a subset of technologies that has both a utility for good and a utility for bad. If, if the view of it is no exception, I mean, like, that was used to be the, uh, the, the control list for, um, for the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So it was well, not, you know, that's, that's, sure. that's a very, very important detail in my point of view because it shows where it comes from. Sure. Uh, it, it comes for, from the fact that there is the acknowledgement that there are dangerous, that there, there are technologies that could be employed for dangerous purposes. No one, can, no, one, no one disputes that. But the arrangement is designed in order to deal with these potential dual use issues. If this was viewed as a munition, it would be on a munitions list. There is a munitions list of, that is administered under the State Department, but the proposal is in the Commerce Control List. And so, in fact, we do regulate code. We regulate actually a lot of code. We do still regulate encryption. And in the case of the United States, encryption regulations is not a substantial issue in the case of, of, of as, as the, the issue that you pointed out. This is, in, in, in fact, I think, an articulation for engaging with the process and dealing with these issues. We regulate a whole lot of code. In fact, this is not just the first step into regulating surveillance technology. Last year, uh, there was regulations that covered MC catchers, which is mobile, uh, mobile phone trackers. And in fact, if you look at the structure of this, you have things like the job, general software availability node. And so this is how we know, for example, that Metasploit, which is a, a, a tool that I think the both of us use quite, uh, quite often, which is an open source exploitation framework. So this, this was something that would be covered on the general software node. So the the general, general, just, to be, just to be clear, what the general software node says that because this is? This is generally available to the public, either commercially or, or, or likely non-commercially, over, you know, over the internet, in store, or is in the public domain. It, it would therefore fall outside of the bus and arrangement. So this, this is what you see within the structure of this dual use list, is you see a narrowing of the cases. In fact, you know, what I, I think is interesting is that in the case of you, you talk about advertising, this is, a, this is articulation. This does not negate the process. This is a reason why you should be involved with the process. You can't say that this is the wrong way about going it because it's imperfect. It's, but it's not just imperfect. It's like we, uh, it, you know, like it, is, it is so clearly, you know, like. But that's actually, so you actually <coughs> talk about some of these technologies. The, the reporting on this, and I think your, your encapsulation of this, is to take, so there's a definition of intrusion software, and this is, everyone should have the sheet. If you, the, the You'll control see. is, uh, this definition of an intrusion software is a technical term. The control is not around actually intrusion software. This was, this was something that came up even because people were concerned of if you got owned and you crossed the border, you might be committing a sanctions violation because your computer is malware and intentionally. <laughs> That's a legitimate concern. What this is, is and, and I think that uh, we actually also, again, agree on, on maybe avoiding the militarization of, of, of the internet and, and, uh, and using a language that, that promotes a militarization of the internet. But what this is, what this language is, is it's about the weaponization of exploitation. The weaponization of exploitation that is for a narrow amount of consumers at a significant amount of, of service level. And so when you start to take in what Vosnar is, and, and when you start to participate, what you find is, in fact, that this definition, if it has a fault, might in fact be too narrow. This is not a war on general purpose computation. This is a war on a very specific subset of very tailored, specially designed surveillance kits. So, so here's, here's, here's something that, that's, that seems to be a potential risk here. So, um, so the company is saying that you know that anything you write in this form, which is a control of uh, software, let's say, let's just constrain it down to software for argument's sake here, um, uh, as an export control, is is uh, uh, going to catch is going to be too broad. Mm -hmm. You already noted that this is this some elements of this are too narrow. Mm -hmm. um, is this actually going to be effective in, in both of these? either of these cases, isn't it? Uh, this is certainly the concern that you know, uh, lawyers in the FF frequently have, that if you create controls on technology where technology is, is 
defined as a range of things which are incredibly fluid, right? You know, it's entirely possible, as, as we were saying earlier, for Finn Fisher to suddenly go, okay, we're going to declare our software to be a special marketing form of surveillance, right? And it's the same software, it's just you've renamed the labels. Um, they can make it generally available, right? God knows there's enough spyware and sensorware being used that, uh, in, in other countries, which is actually the weaponization of filterware that's used in schools and libraries or key, key loggers that are used to tap people's children, right? It's the same, it's the same thing. Do you not run into the problem here that the only thing that you're going to create here is potential collateral damage because it'll never actually catch the bad guy? Well, in fact, Bupan announced that they felt that they were subject to the, to the Bostonar changes and would be making uh, changes to their business model based off of this language. So immediately... I can um, tell you what they do in the future. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, so kind of they're saying zero day vulnerabilities that in of themselves are simply flaws. They're not actually recognized yet. Right? Mm -hmm. So how is their business model uh, threatened by Bostonar? The interesting thing is um, let's, let's get time to answer it then. Because that then opens up a whole lot of other questions. How have they changed it? Uh, yeah, how do they feel like covered and how has it changed their business model? Because I think that's a really important way of understanding this. Well, I, I think it was specific to, to Bupan, all they announced is they felt that they were covered by Boston. These are companies that, by their business model, are opaque in the way that they do operations. If you force them into being generally available, then oh, this is a not fundamental oh, right. okay. Not yeah. because of the nature of what they're selling, but because their software is not generally available. Because their software, well, both. It would be a combination of both. But to speak to both of these points, what you're talking about is them fundamentally changing their business model. And so this is a business model that, that thrives on opacity. Selling malware and, and having a weaponized malware is, is about exclusivity. It's, about, it's, it's a, a, about a significant business relationship. We are talking about the, the business model of Gamma is not selling it like, like Dark Comet is selling, which is a, a PayPal account that you clear them. It's, it's about a service model that is exclusive. When you buy uh, Gamma, you know, Spin Fisher products or Hacking Team products, you're not just buying something that can exploit. You're buying a near guarantee that somebody is going to be exploited. That is not something that translates very well. And in fact, uh, that would, by definition, fall outside of, of the Boston Arts General Availability Note. Again, just add a point on yeah. um, I think, that, uh, and a, a note of caution, because I think it's also interesting that we are right now still in the process of these new controls being implemented. So de facto, they are actually yet to be implemented in the in export control regime. Right. So if a company comes out and already takes a certain position on this, um, there is some politics involved in the US government right now trying to figure out how to actually implement those controls. So if you issue a certain statement, you already influence that process in and of itself. So to what degree that is captured by them or not, we don't know because right now the, the implementation process is in the process of, of, uh, of being worked out. So I think and Lupin was saying they were willing to or they felt <coughs> to comply. Yeah. Okay. The interesting thing with that is um, that we already uh, talked a little, um, little bit about the business model behind surveillance. And um, I, um, we completely agree um, about uh, uh, companies like like Gamma and attacking team in, in terms we don't like their business. I don't like it at all. But especially Wupen is a little bit a different case because uh, it shows uh, where the real like, like this business uh, uh, is working which affected us much more than, than uh, those with the um, export controls. Because what they sell is actually not weaponized exploits, it's just vulnerabilities to uh, those services, uh, to, to those agencies which can weaponize them on uh, their own behalf, uh, like the NSA, like GHCQ. So the interesting thing is, uh, if Vasana would cover that as well, um, we have an even funnier problem, because um, I, uh, the knowledge about vulnerability <clears throat> it's, a, it's like a funny you know, and a, a very interesting legal ex aspect of like IP in terms of who owns the vulnerability. Is it the person who wrote the, the vulnerable code? Because you know, like he produced the code, so in the normal means, 
it would uh, uh, we would say uh, it's owned by the by the vulnerable like um, for example, yeah. For example, yeah. But, um, yeah, so but it's not his intention, so we cannot really claim IP for that. So that's at least the case we have right now. If it comes to exploitation in terms of uh, export controls, so the question is how would you regulate an idea? Because it's basically telling something, and we had this nice discussion a couple of minutes ago, what it, what it actually means. If you look to vulnerabilities, uh, let's say exploit, for example, there is an example of an exploit from, or like a vulnerability from Wupen, it's all about one character, which was like wrong. To get full, like exploitation on uh, this machine without any any big um, big uh, something to do. So, um, this is basically something which you cannot regulate in a in a, in a, in a simple and and uh, 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 meaningful way. Um, moreover, if you start to regulate that, it, it can become very very dangerous for security. So, well, if you that's, an example, uh, that's an example, I'm from Germany, so, so uh, we have a, a law called the so-called Hacker Tools Law, which is all about um, that you are not allowed to distribute uh, or, or use tools for, um, which are meant to be attack tools. The problem with that is that people need to use their tools to prove their own security. Those tools are all attack tools. There, there is no defensive tool and only for defensive means. That, that doesn't simply exist. So people um, are not releasing their code on specific like uh, um, yeah, tests just for saying, okay, there's a law for, uh, uh, which forbids me to release that. And people who need to use them, those tools say, okay, this, this says something, I'm not allowed to do that. So I'm not doing it and I, I'm not able to, to take care about my, my security. So, um, even though nobody get, got ever convicted because of that, that paragraph, it has a, uh, a real, a real effect on, on, and a relative effect on, on real life security. And that's the basic thing you have with all those, those type of regulation, where it comes to to um, to, to regulating parts uh, where most of the time you have a good use. So I, I wanted to try and bring this down into, into, into sort of particularly practical concerns. Well, I mean, one of the issues here is we know that the, in, unlike the, the crypto wars, we know that the intention here is to stop bad people using this software for bad purposes, right? That's, that's the specific intent. And what we're sort of arguing about here is the mapping between those two things. So are we going to catch um, good people using the software for good purposes, well, work out the entire matrix. But 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 we're trying to limit it, and we're trying to limit it in a particularly a particular way. Um, I know that at the EFF, one of our concerns about th these kinds of rules in particular is because many of the good actors, like security researchers, like people trying, for instance, to break controls on their own device to reassert some control. Um, those people are often framed or perceived by governments as actually being bad actors, right? I think that, that you know, definitely mu much of the concern that's gone on here has been listening to politicians and uh, civil society sort of talking about these things in very general terms and a legitimate concern by people who have been caught up by this in the past that they will be um, uh, uh, pillarized or, 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 or targeted in this way simply because governments don't understand that the people fighting to protect this up or break this up. I mean, you, 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 you've been involved in systems times where like infiltrating data from Syrian systems um, uh, has been something. It's not in, <laughs> so I'm not, this is not, I said involved in a vague sort of like a, a community analyzing. This, this data. Would you just like to put the camera towards the window for a second? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, some of the uh, some of the analysis. <laughs> let me let me self-incriminate. Some of the analysis that we have did with Citizen Map, we're dealing with moving data across borders, 
We're dealing with um, um, independent security researchers. We're dealing with exactly this kind of like traffic that, that goes on. I mean, my concern looking at this is, is that actually this is creating, trying to create a black and white line where actually the people are most vulnerable are the people who are in these gray areas. Um, do you, I mean, is this, is this a sort of good yeah. summary? I mean, how do you reassure people that this isn't going to be misused, particularly when, you know, signatures to the Bassanara arrangement include um, Israel and China, right? The, no, the, the, no, no. All the adopters of the Bassanara language, okay. That's, that's the, the often they'll, they will follow the French are about it, and the French are really bad in, in I can agree with you there, yes. <laughs> um, that's, 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 you know, almost Europe-wide. But, but this could be, this could be taken and misused. You, and, but you're confident that the language will protect it from being misused in that way. I'm confident that participation by civil society and people who have these concerns and have the ability and willingness to <coughs> interrogate the document is the only means of interacting with the process that is going on right now and has already been adopted within the Bassanara arrangement. I think that there is a different conversation between our old battle wounds and an actual legal text. And I think that we come into these things with legitimate concerns, but these legitimate concerns are different from a textual analysis based off of the law. And when we start to look at things like jailbreaking and antivirus that has been expressed as concerns in public posts and in our conversation, it's very clear that within the law, within the law of the way that it exists, or rather within the recommendations and with, within the implementations, it'll be more clear. These things are not covered. And so we have to engage in this process directly and within a, a legalistic framework and a legalistic discourse rather than coming into it and just saying, I don't feel good about any governmental regulation, which is what we've been doing. We've been expressing emotions versus expressing specific points of contention. And so if, for example, the word generation is inaccurate or overbroad, then we need to be able to offer a different word other than generation in, you know, specifically uh, for a, you know, for, or, you know, to that effect. That's what, when we have been successful in engaging with these processes, what but, we haven't done. Right, but this, 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 is, this, this language was not created by civil, civil society, and this process is opaque to civil society. I don't so. think it's true. I don't think that civil society has engaged in, in a mechanism that exists. There are technical advisory committees. There are open solicitations for responses. There are legislative means that exist. And by and large, there has been not a direct participation in the venues that, that exist for industry and for everyone else. And there are ways, there are recommendations of, of furthering that. You know, we should be saying whether the, what, what the, the form of control is, because there are different levels of control even. There is a control that is an absolute embargo on the export, and then there are controls that are just, you know, uh, send an email once every year to this email address. There is a wide range of controls, and we aren't having a conversation even about that. And so if we don't have that conversation, then we don't have any involvement in the process. And this is why we have had no relationship with the end language. Okay, uh, sorry. We, we, uh, I think now I should run a stack. So, so, I mean, you, 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 you get it. I, I'm, um, I always get the same argument, you know, like, that those concerns are not, uh, you know, like, not tied to the, to the, to the, um, um, like, language here. But, you know, like, laws are always not, just what they, they, they said, they, are, they, they have, like, a much broader um, effect on how people behave, what people think they are, and more uh, specifically, in my point of view, that's the first step to declare the, uh, the export's weapons. And that's simple like, it's simple like that because I've been in, a, in a lots of you know, like discussions and in a lots of uh, uh, like sessions where it was all about like export controls, or at least it was some part of it was about export controls, and it was all about digital weapons. And for me, um, this is like something really, really weird. I mean, like for, I have, in my point of view, there is nothing like a digital weapon, or if we have something like a digital weapon, it's, all, uh, it's big data, that's the only weapon we have to talk about in a digital mean, in my point of view, but all, you know, like, it's, um, human rights don't 
you know, like they're not tied to the change of a library running on a system. That's not, you know, like that's not we're gonna uh, have the right discussions and the right policies. What we in the moment, or what, what this is actually, uh, uh, um, what this actually is, is like uh, making the business of a couple of companies much harder. It doesn't mean that they don't have business anymore. In my point of view, it's even even uh, the the the, um, the the opposite because having this means a lot of very very good possibilities to make a lot of money. I mean, like that's that's basically it. Just by you know, like having a market which is which um, works m much more towards you know like we don't talk about it uh, or we just go directly to companies uh, to, to, to to countries and build companies over there. So we don't need to to talk about uh, uh, controls at all. So for those companies, it's actually very nice to have those things as long as they. Um, as they don't care about their, their, their public uh, standing. So that they have the resources to reach out yes. and regulate. And I mean, I, and, um, if you really look to those cases, there are two things which I can really interesting. One thing is, um, and you uh, can uh, comment on that, but I think I'm, I'm right, those exploits we are talking about, they are not like, uh, 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 most of the time, nothing else about the shelf exploits. It's not that, that it's like, very sophisticated, uh, yeah. so that means that those people get exploited anyway, or they are already exploited. It's just another another uh, player exploit them. Yeah. It's not that they are high value targets that get uh, targeted by zero days. Uh, usually they get a target uh, uh, attacked by, by vulnerabilities that, that are years old. That's at least from my experience. Yeah, and um, on the other hand, yeah, uh, it doesn't really do anything about the business. So, so, so let's let's so I so we can throw this. Up. How much time have we got now? Twenty minutes. Oh, okay. That's fine. Great. Okay. So this seems to be a good way of opening things up. So I see you then. Do you, you still got your hand? Yeah. Right? Okay. So um, we'll go this way, this way, and then Tim, because you've already spoken before. And then you've already spoken before, so you've thought a lot of stuff. I mean, so part of the reason I presume why there's so much focus being put on export controls is that there seems to be very little avenues, very few avenues to influence and prevent companies from acting, you know, in a way which is intentionally intended to violate human rights. So, you know, what you're coming up against here is a complete lack of regulation of international corporations. You know, people in Ethiopia are experiencing what people in, um, the Ogoni people in Nigeria have seen, or trade unions in Argentina who, you know, where Mercedes were complicit in violations against them. So my question is, is you know, what, what other avenues are there available to try and prevent this from happening? Because, you know, in the absence of anything else, and it, it seems right to focus on this, you know, it is, is inadequate. I have a couple of things to say to me. Yeah, I keep it I mean, short. My, my, my other to that is, um, actually, the, the, um, what Snowdog uh, showed us is like, that we live in an incredible, insecure, uh, technical world. So, um, the means we need to fight surveillance is basically getting more secure technology. And in my point of view, the, uh, there are policies um, uh, thinkable which, uh, which are specifically uh, help like no, not only us, but also like people in other countries. Which means like if I have software liabilities, if I have warranties, um, which we don't have with software at the moment, sorry to, 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 to take that example again, there are only two types of businesses uh, where you don't have um, real like liabilities uh, and you are called a user, that's like uh, the software industry and, and, and um, drug trade. So that's, that's like the places where you don't, uh, where you can't expect to get what you expect. And with software, it's the same thing. You don't get what you expect. You just get something uh, running on your machine, but most of the time, it's incredible and uh, um, um, vulnerable. So we have to uh, have that part much more, you know, like, be able to think about that. Uh, and that's the most important part, 
at all. But I think I think the problem is is that despite me bringing up blue pen, there is no evidence, and I don't know why blue pen made its decision, but there is no evidence within this that exploits are being are, are being proposed to be regulated. There's no vulnerability, there's no indication that vulnerabilities and exploits of, of, of vulnerabilities are covered by any part of this document. Well, on the contrary, actually the people that drafted this language in the UK government have explicitly told us that this is intended not to be covered in terms of the actual But I have to say that the only <laughs> example of behavior that we've seen change is a vulnerability company. So, it, you know, the intention isn't, isn't Part of the, they know the, more yeah. about their business model and the way that their business model, precisely because this is an unregulated market, this does more than make uh, make the lives or, or business of, of, of a, a couple of companies hard. What this puts into place is is transparency or an accountability to at least some third party on the behaviors of companies that have been previously unregulated. This puts into place potential criminal. And, and legal damages for violations of these. This puts into place a relationship with human rights accountability practices uh, and conversations, things like the State Department's annual human rights reports, for better or for worse, all of a sudden become a part of the conversation around these. This means that the provision of things like FinSpy involve DRL potentially involves civil society, the, the Human Rights Division of the State Department. So this doesn't just make actually, uh, their, their businesses maybe have a few less customers. This in fact put in, puts into place mechanisms of accountability that don't exist right now. So I think just to talk to the question, the question was like, well, okay, if we have systems of, if what we want to do is introduce systems of responsibility, what, what alternatives are there if this, if this it, it, it has issues with it? And I mean, I think, I mean, just because we, I should at least put my, take my moderator hat off and put on my EFF bearer, I mean, definitely one of the things to include in this is the case that you, you talked about, where we're actually suing the Ethiopian government for conducting um, essentially surveillance on, on US soil. And of course, that's, that's a particular subset of behaviors. But the other part of this, I think, that's worth noting is that the border is a very interesting place to try and introduce these controls. I mean, certainly what we're talking about is people producing surveillance and intrusion equipment within certain countries. Um, and there's an entire world of regulation that might exist within those places. And of course, it's not touching the development of intrusion and surveillance equipment and software within the countries that I think we're presumably talking about, which is the, being used for, for, for repressive purposes. So, I, I mean, I, I'll throw this open for, for other alternatives, right? But, but I mean, this is, I mean, this is, this is limited in itself, and there, I, I do think that there are other alternatives. The Syrians, for example, they don't need a uh, hacking key for, for getting... Uh, but they don't need a blue code. Yeah, well, but, 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 uh, but, but the special uh, team don't, don't even need that. Sure, but there's a difference between something that is, uh, Morgan brought this up actually on Monday, there's a difference between what's sophisticated and what's effective. And you can't do anything against a, a dozen people who are just creative and up against it. But there's a difference between what the Syrians are doing and what things like the Ethiopian government has promised. The Syrians are, are being persistent and being aggressive and have a few tricks. But the, what, what hacking team sells Ethiopia is the promise that a particular device, no matter what the device is, will be compromised because a, a professional team of people is backing the compromising control of that device. We're not talking about the exploitation. We're talking about a massive infrastructure. We're not talking about the means but of exploitation. Actually, We're talking about the infrastructure for controlling, administering, and, and eventually uh, exfiltrating the data from that device. And this is something which I found very interesting because this is not what's inside the Asana agreement. Because um, what we are talking about is basically is, is, uh, has been defeated. This is like the service they provide for, you know, like uh, it large scale education. It isn't. Yeah, right. point, okay, it's not how I read it, it's not how the lawyers I talk to read it. It's and they, they are already with export controls. 
they are actually the, the lowest PU. So I'm going to cut that off because I don't think that's resolvable. <laughs> and then uh, pass up here. Um, uh, and I'll pass over to Ben, who's been an academic working in Sure. So just to respond first of all to the question that's over here, which I think is very important. Um, for all of the conversation about export controls, they're a small part of the overall conversation. And they can't be the only or each sure. main form of leverage. So like the litigation is going on in EFF and Ethiopia, there's numerous other avenues. I so the 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 other system you can system is I mean, you know, no, we're they're desperate. There's nothing there, that's why they're going right, to Right, I agree. The OEC complaint just shows weakness in the legal system that we have to call companies to account for this. But let's also be honest about why this customer's agreement is even put in place. This agreement in its current language was put in place because governments were sued to stand up to their human rights obligations. That's the reason we're having these conversations. Governments were sued, they were told, what the fuck are you doing about human rights? Why are you letting this happen? And they had to respond, and they responded in this manner. So we can spend all day discussing what's actually in the terms, and even more complicated than that, what people will interpret that to be. Because I think the interpretation is like, people can have many different kinds of interpretation, of course there will be um, collateral damage on both sides. I don't so much agree with Colin's very legalistic approach because at the end of the day, what people believe is in the regulation is what the regulation comes to be. Right. So we need to be extremely careful to ensure that the right people are affected by it and the wrong people aren't affected by it. That doesn't mean that there aren't other forms of leverage precisely because governments, which are bound by their international human rights obligations, are part of this industry and part of this market. And in a sense, it's more the sort of the, there's a lot of historic baggage in all of this, in the sense that we, we say we won the crypto awards, and to be honest, we, know. we, we may have just about got a nice amendment to them in the US at an international level, they were never won. We were lucky in that how they played out, and that was a nice thing. In the same way that the security industry over a period of time has evolved, and that has included some bad actors. And now we're faced with how to deal with the fact that Hacking Team and Finn Fisher are causing people to be locked up and tortured. And that's just a, a, a sort of a fact of life that governments will be asked to deal with. There will be lots of other solutions other than export controls. They will also be important. But just sort of assuming that the, the very bureaucratic language of this, which is at the end of the day just a boring bureaucratic process, will somehow make that go away is also naive. So it's just it's one step in the human rights obligation that states have. And at least in, like, let me speak to Germany, in the German case, the penalties aren't particularly interesting. There's not even criminal penalties involved. You can get fined for education. It's like this is this is a slow, bureaucratic, boring process that isn't. Actually, it's not right. If you uh, um, if you export without uh, uh, the proper um, paper, you can get into trouble. You can get into trouble for sure. The, 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 the as long as you don't sell uh, ships and, and guns. Exactly, but that's <laughs> the thing. And so specifically, <laughs> the, the language of this thing. For the most part, we're talking about a very boring bureaucratic process. But precisely because people who do security software are like, so concerned about this, and they're concerned possibly legitimately because they've been screwed by the government so often in the past. It's right, totally, it's not just not like somehow this is some random concern. We've got to be even more even harder to ensure that people are fully clear about what the potential negative consequences of this are, because they have seen the NSA documents and they have great experience of dealing with asshole governments. My, my argument for legalism, just to be clear, it is not about, is, it's not about trust in, in the wording of a document, but about the level of engagement and the type of engagement you have. And so what I'm saying is, is that there's a difference between an, uh, an engagement in a legal document and a legal process, and, and sort of this emotional mechanism that we've had so far. All of the things that you said are valid, are, are, are what, I, what I agree with. Uh, and I, I want to make that clear. This is one avenue amongst many, including lawsuits, uh, including uh, complaints. We are desperate. These are all desperate moves. But we don't have any other option if we think that there should be, if, if the democratic, democratic process and the human rights process you know, is to exist with regard to these technologies. Yeah, but, but you know, like, um, um, what I find a little bit weird is that this all uh, so detached from from the main problem we have, and the main problem is insecurity. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to go uh, one uh, using my power as moderator. I mean, one thing I just want to add to that is um, is is one thing that we that we were talking about is that in the recent Udaben uh, 
versus Cisco case that was thrown out, which seemed interesting, and one of the things that the judge used was this argument that if what Cisco was doing so bad was so bad, there would be export controls on it. And I think this this is this is doubly worrying, right? That this this is this is an interrelation between what we might try to do here in a limited way and what we try to do in other avenues and how those things interrelate. And maybe it's an argument for introducing even stronger export controls, but maybe it's also an argument for saying, look, these these cannot be the, the be all and end all of this, that this isn't what 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 this is intended to do. So um, yes. sorry. Yeah. You just mentioned the Cisco because uh, I'm a shareholder and I have a, a two proposals to uh, Cisco. And for me, I have a lot of time to engage with Cisco. Right, right. So that's it. Uh, particularly because uh, when we talk about the uh, export, uh, I'm a town master, uh, the student, uh, the completion of value there. So basically, the law is still there. After the town master, the, the, the US Congress has like, lowered the, the private last written the Cisco complaint. So why? So only come to be a so many companies. Every company I have to do the same thing. So it's actually the the the, the, the of art. It's a, it's a, another it's a, the value. So that's it. the whole the business to this thing. And then now, now, now <coughs> change differently is that the full government now when we talk about the the priority is the thing about the, the, the export control tech machine uh, the the, 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 the complication uh, uh, facility, but now so it's a the software. And now we come. Uh, to another way, uh, uh, another direction, like import control. For example, uh, uh, China's uh, uh, WeChat, uh, they have 300 million users, and not like, like we Chinese people in America we use WeChat. And now we find out the, the, the censorship. Uh, so that's like a, the, the Chinese information to back to, uh, to the American or to the world, and nobody is like, how to like, check the censorship, how to talk about it with that. Okay. So maybe um, when like uh, Alibaba, or they, they come to America, to the East, they, they come to America. Right. And that's the thing we can buy a purchase their, their stock, and then they share order to, to talk to engage with like, uh, the Chinese company, they come to America. So this is another way to say, like, I don't know, of course, like an import control. <laughs> right, so, so, so your argument here is, is this idea that, that you know, rather than just preventing things going out, that there are always going to be some globalization. Yeah, there's a, there's a toys, right? Like right, there'll be something like here that, that, that you can impose controls on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to pick up some of the elements that I think this discussion has done um, to reveal and I think put on the table. Um, and I fully I want to echo what Ben uh, pointed out and what Kahani pointed out in terms of the underlying problem being that we have in secure technologies. And I think if you look at the general effort that has gone into making systems more secure in the past years, this has been the weakest link in many countries in terms of hardening the systems and trying to actually do that. Um, so I think that can go a long way. At the same time, I think there is a caveat to that that um, the coders in the room will know that if even any effort to try to build more secure technologies can only go so far and 100% secure technology is not really possible that you'll always have some sort of flaw that will be built into the software code in and of itself. Or usually it's just the user. Or the yeah. user. Yeah, which is <laughs> And I think this goes back to the, the argument, it's not really an either or, I think it needs to be a, uh, a, a parallel process so that we can raise the bar to make surveillance a lot more, not only harder, but also more costly for whoever wants to do that. Um, at the same time, I think there, the securing technology in and of itself won't solve that problem and it won't get rid of the problem that we're currently facing of Western companies exporting these technologies to governments and to countries where we know that people are not only having their privacy invaded, but end up in jail and potentially be tortured down the road. I think a key difference to the crypto war experience in the 1990s is a difference in, in interest from the government side. In the 1990s, it was clear, especially in the US context, that encryption controls were considered to be munitions. And the government had an active interest in trying to control it and to view uh, the individual hacker or individual, like private actors, as the bad actor. Um, so it was very much this fight between the government and um, people that are security researchers. I think as, as we've been looking into this for the past year and a half, I would argue there's actually a change in the situation we are finding ourselves in right now because the government is actually not the one who's trying to defend this, this technology 
because they're not the ones who are making a profit out of it. So I think that the, con the co constellation of interests from the government side is different from the 1990s and that the government actually has an interest in making sure that the way this language is being implemented doesn't have unintended consequences. And I think to, to make uh, an empirical example, uh, all of you are reading the news and will come across the cybersecurity latest news or the new bill or something needs to happen to avoid cyber war or whatever. I would actually make the argument that the government has a very active interest to make sure that security researchers aren't impacted by this very language because they are interested in making sure that cybersecurity is being addressed because they face currently huge problems in that area and don't have the means to actually do that and are dependent on these security professionals to help mitigate this problem. And the last point that I wanted to make um, was um, <laughs> is something else that Kami mentioned in terms of the Bosnia regime and whether it's an appropriate forum. I think this is the type of question or issue that we need to fo focus on more and break down this debate from a very ideological, uh, R's for controls, good or bad, and looking more at the programmatic, like what does the language look like and what is the appropriate regime? Because I think there are many people that actually agree with you that Vasana has morphed over time. It's no longer what it was developed to do. Encryption is one example of what was initially considered to be a munition, but it's now part of the dual use list. And there are other examples of like chemicals that are what's somehow it, part of the. What's the dual use of encryption? It's something I don't understand. And I think, but that becomes a different debate. That becomes a debate of do we new, do we need a new regime entirely, where you would take out the encryption controls out of Larsenar and would put it under a new regime, and where something like surveillance technology could become part of as well. And it's a broader discussion about what kind of institutional mechanisms should be the avenue to address that. And I think that's a very legitimate question of, do we actually want to keep this in a framework that came out of the Cold War and that had a focus on munitions or not? And I think these are the kind of questions where it comes to the implementation, and this goes back to this three point. What Colin pointed out in terms of level of engagement, there are avenues that haven't been fully exploited yet in terms of the technical advisory committees looking at the actual language and submitting letters in terms of here are our concerns, very legitimate concerns of how could this affect security researchers and what needs to be taken into account because this language isn't the done deal. This is right now being looked at from the government side in trying to implement this through licensing policy, trying to determine what kind of end users would uh, the export of this technology require a license for. So a lot of these concerns can actually become integrated into the implementation process and by issuance of frequently asked questions, clarifications from the government side to very much integrate the concerns that we have and to potentially counter some uh, statements from other actors or companies that are trying to already frame this implementation in a very different way. Um, and whoever wants to engage with that, please come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so but, but once on the, on the, on the, on the government, I mean, I don't think that uh, you said they, they have uh, an interest uh, in protecting the security people on one hand, on the other hand, but they don't have an interest to uh, export those, those technology. The weird thing is, as I said, this is what we have here, exactly what's uh, recommended by, uh, uh, for example, the, the uh, Etsy standard. Exactly what's, what's in here. So that shows very clearly that something is awkward. You don't need to know much more than, than just this little pack. The NC is the law for it. Yeah, and um, <coughs> I feel like um, security researchers are a big danger for companies and also for the state. And I always recognize that when we, uh, for example, give us an e passport or something like that, uh, that the way we get attacked, the way they, uh, how they, they, they even, even if we have a much better way of dealing with like hackers in, in public in Germany because they are somewhat different than in the US for example. So they are not, not only criminals in Germany, they are also some sort of heroes. So, so still, um, there is, uh, or at least I recognize uh, that there is a way to frame it that those people doing security are always bad persons no matter what they do. Um, and to, to, to only include, uh, uh, to, 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 to frame the good people as those people who work for, the, for, for law, enforcement, um, law enforcement needs. And this is a very, very weird situation. It is different than 10 years ago, but it's uh, even worse than that. So I think we've, we've, we've run out of time, but uh, I, mean, I think that the, the, the conclusion that I think everybody can agree to is that we really need to keep an eye on this. 
I think that um, uh, uh, more involvement is, is important. And I think one of the points that we can also point out is that um, Actually, somebody said to me, you know, okay, what's the calculus here? That this is something that will protect human rights in certain countries and the people who um, are worried about it are a, a small group of people, a small group of technologists. And I mean, I would like to point out that that small group of technologists are the people who are actually detecting and working and fighting this. So I think that, that even though there's two, there's two sides to a debate here, we have to take, pay, take, pay attention to both groups because as a, we've, all, we've all agreed that you know, defending and increasing security is the only long-term solution to this. And the uh, um, vulnerable group on one side of this, or at least the people most concerned about their vulnerability, are going to be the people who, are going to be, who, who, will, who will improve that security. So it's a really great debate. I hope you continue to follow what uh, all of our, 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 our panelists are writing on this. And, um, and take this piece of paper away and start scribbling on it and send it up.